All right, hello, and welcome back to the Chase Almost Podcast with old friend, the oldest of friends, David so Roth. Hi. You know, we're both so old now, man. I'm 66 years young. I've got mm-hmm. a, I had a lot of work done. Uh, yeah. I guess it's obvious because there's a, a visual element to mm-hmm. this. Yeah, so these are all new. Cheap. <laughs> uh, How's your vision? Because uh, can I tell you a funny story about my vision? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So I'm wearing glasses. I'm nearsighted. I've been nearsighted since I was like 16 years old. And it's gotten like my, I was able to get by with just needing them at night for a while and like just to see the board in class Mm -hmm. where, which is everything about just adolescence is stupid and what kids will pick on like, oh, you can't see the board. What a loser. What are you? (laughs) What? Yeah. I'd love to look at what's on the, what teacher writes on the board. That's where I get my lessons. Yeah. Yeah, Like, but I know. It's so stupid, but Whatever it was one of those things. Do. Yeah, you're self conscious <laughs> about it, and you're like, "This is silly. Why was yeah. I ever self conscious about it?" And it's just uh, as I gotten older, it's gotten progressively worse. And then it like there was a big jump in one of my eyes uh, a year or two ago, and I was like, "Oh, that's not good." Where I was, <laughs> he was showing me the prescription, and like when the optometrist is like, "Is that you can't see that yeah. one?" And I'm you don't like, want to see any face acting from those yes. guys when you're doing you're in there. Not yeah, you're like, oh, this is this is bad. And then, um, but I've never worn contacts. I tried it when I was like, uh, when I was in high school. You know, I haven't either. It's I've never horrible. It. Yeah. Did you know that it's mostly a woman, a woman thing that if you look at the, just who buys contacts and like how that works, it's such a small male market. Like really? the, very, very small. It's mostly women. And I asked my optometrist about this because I was like, my wife who has perfect vision and didn't have to do with it. My mom has worn contacts her entire life. Mm-hmm. And I asked, I was like, it seems like. There is, but is that actually true? And he's like, oh, well, it's because women are used to just putting on, like, mascara and makeup and doing weird stuff with their eyes all day and moving around their eyelids and stuff to get ready in the morning. That it's just something they just add naturally to your day-to-day. And men are like, I'm not spending two minutes, like, just doing this just draconian eye pull and stuff in this thing in my eye i can't tell you how gratifying it is to hear this because that's always (laughs) been the reason why especially it's like i basically stopped playing basketball when my eyesight got bad enough that i I needed to be wearing my glasses out there and i wasn't gonna have them i had them get broken you weren't gonna do the horace grant thing no i should have i actually (laughs) did so rec specs surprisingly Mm -hmm. extremely expensive like you basically I could have gotten like a pair of Gucci frames or I could have gotten the Chris <laughs> models like it was but it was like value neutral like $20 yeah. difference. So but I what I you know I could have the the easier way there would have been to just get contact lenses yeah. and wear them for sports which is what you're supposed to do and the whole of the reason why I didn't do it is like I don't want to touch my own eyeball. Yes. Like I don't want anything to do with these. Like I they're important to me. I like to use them for the things I use my eyes for, but like no touching of mm-hmm. any kind nothing goes in like, <laughs> hopefully nothing comes out like that's just those are the rules mm-hmm. and yeah i mean it is definitely that makes sense that that would be people that like are used to inconveniencing themselves for yes. like stupid beauty standard reasons would be like ah, this is just one other stupid thing i have to do right but like i'm not doing that <laughs> like if I, I could avoid it and he's like yeah men are such babies with this stuff where he's yeah. like i've had just like muscle like just jacked up men to like try to get contacts in and it's just like it, pulling teeth like it's one of those things and i spent i kid you not an hour practicing so my wife had a mandate she was like look you can do the glasses no glasses whatever but for the wedding you're wearing contacts Mm-hmm. And like it was this looming black cloud for the last like two months before you my wedding. You have was... to buck up at least once and yes. touch the eye. <laughs> Here's what I did though, and the most and all my best friends who were in the wedding were like, "This is the most chase thing I've ever heard." Where I have a good relationship with my optometrist, and I spent an hour uh, trying to get it in and trying to figure it out, and I was like. I don't trust myself on wedding day. Like, this is not going to happen. Like, I'm not, this is clearly not for me. I, my eyes are red now because of this whole experience. I hate all of this. This whole thing is terrible. And I was like, can I come in on my wedding day? Can, can we just meet up and you just put, pop these bad boys in? Uh, and then I'm on my way and I'm ready to go. And he was like, absolutely. So I had to, they were like, where are you going? You should. My like, wedding morning, get like their I makeup just makeup done on their wedding day. I mean, it's like this is yes. You should, uh, treat yourself. It's your day to be a princess. Treat yourself, and that's <laughs> what I did with those contacts and put them in. And 
they feel great. It's like, wow, what an amazing thing. And then you're like the whole pulling out process. So before we went on our honeymoon the next day, uh, he was not there because most optometrists are not open on Sundays. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I sleeping in them terrible like yeah. i was i had one they, eye so they are very clear that you're not supposed to do that i know and i was like can i just invite my optometrist to the wedding just so he can get my eyes out <laughs> uh, get my contacts out at the end of it but it was it was a whole thing and i remember just the feeling and i was like we can't go on the road to the honeymoon until like i stop at an optometrist and i found one uh like on the way to Asheville, and it was it was perfect i was just like i need you to rip these bad i was like hey i'm gonna preface this this is a weird request i don't need new frames or anything like that i just need <laughs> you to uh rip these contacts out of my eyes because my eyes are burning and i'm uh i gotta go i got things do they to even do. have like a price schedule for that like is it the sort of <laughs> they like what do you charge just be like just touch my eyes and just very briefly there's a thing in them yes you know what it is i think they're is more like concerned about like the uh legal ramifications yes. of messing up my eye by yeah. doing the process and i was like i'll sign whatever like if you bl <laughs> if you blind me i'm okay with the the consequences here because i just need these out whatever yeah. you gotta do because i don't that, i'm not gonna get, get them out myself but it was, i feel it was like fun. that's definitely like contact lenses are for people who especially like in my 20s would have been like i was not responsible enough to have mm -hmm. this because I could have, I would have been the person that like left them in for like five days. Because one thousand like, percent, oh, like yeah, just that's stupid. What? Oh, like we're at the bar and you're, they're just like, what's going on? Like your eyes are like dripping. Like there's red. Like when was the last time you took your kind? You're like, oh, contacts. That's right. right. Those I have been those. In I put those for a while. Wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Not. <laughs> no. Not for me. And my mom has this whole process. I've always seen her growing, like just growing up. That's what she did, like her thing. And it was just organized and well-planned. And I was like, no, that's never going to be me. That's yeah. never going to happen. Maybe one day I'll get LASIK or something. But even for LASIK, I think you might need to like put me under because I don't know if I can do the whole laser. Because that right. was a mistake. Looking at what they actually do is uh, is a mistake, David. Yes. I don't know if you've seen the process no, and I... like the big gadgets and stuff. And you're like, oh, this is terrifying. It's like a James Bond yes. villain scenario. <laughs> like you're definitely... <laughs> Like, they're like, I I expect you to die, you know, mm -hmm. and you're like, okay, well, I'll see you in half an hour when you're done fixing <laughs> my eyesight. But it is very, like, yeah, I, again, I think that this is the lowest amount of intervention that you can do, basically, like, mm -hmm. just to get me back to normal. My sight isn't bad. It, you know, it gets worse. I go, like, you know, half a prescription down every couple of years or whenever I need mm -hmm. to get stuff, like, replaced. I can see okay without them. Uh, can you drive? Great. Uh, I wouldn't drive without them, no, okay. not at this point. I mean, I can drive in the sense that, like, the broad strokes are there, but, like, reading a sign or something like that, mm -hmm. I'd have to be real close to it. And the It's weird, though, that you said that, like, when you realized that you needed glasses, because I remember I didn't get mine until I was a senior in college, I think. Oh, wow. And it was, and I definitely needed them before then, but it mm -hmm. would be like, I would get to class late, and then would just i remember saying this to a friend once i was like i get that it's stupid that i get there late i get to everything late but like you get there late in the big classrooms and like you can't even see what what they're writing on the board mm -hmm. and it's like no you can see it like, <laughs> like it's definitely like anyone can see it like i think that this might be a you problem it wasn't even that big classroom and i was like oh like so not everybody is like struggling if they're not in the first five rows to like <laughs> <laughs> read something that a guy is writing in chalk consciously as big as he can write it this is such a guy thing too like that is <laughs> the most guy thing, thing ever it's like man it sucks getting to class late where you can't see the board because i got in there late and i'm too far up and they're like nope we can all see it pretty yeah. far up and it would just never occur to me that it wasn't supposed to be that way mm -hmm. that is very like i mean that's been like a running thing <laughs> on the the distraction podcast with drew is that both of us sort of are like in awe of what disgusting idiots our younger selves were that he was like yes i had a forming grill i used it to cook dinner every night like <laughs> i needed but like, <laughs> like until i had like a serious girlfriend i didn't know you were supposed to clean it i thought it just cleaned itself <laughs> and it was just like so gnarly to imagine like that version of him like 25 year old drew bear just <laughs> hammering some chicken thighs in that thing all the fat runs off and he's like done perfect do it again tomorrow <laughs> I um do you know in my freshman year of uh of college I'd forgotten about this story but I had somehow in my suburban Atlanta life uh growing up I had never actually used blinds like there was never <laughs> <laughs> I just had never used them. Like it was just never like hammer a towel over the window or something like what was going no. on. My room 
so we had this spinner um how can i frame this i lived in like one house for 18 years Mm -hmm. and like my room was the only one i really would mess with but it had like um i don't know how to explain it it's like a little stick and it Mm -hmm. literally just twirled up and down that's all i would do every day i just twirled the stick if i wanted to open my blinds and i'd twirl it the other way if i didn't those weren't a thing in college so i went in my and i remember like just staring at my blinds and just being intimidated by like what I'm supposed to do. Cause I was like, I don't know, this is really embarrassing. I need to ask someone how to use the blinds. I remember I called my best friend. I was like, Hey, I need your help. And he came over. He's like, what's going on? And I was like, I don't know how to open my blinds. And he had to show me how to like the whole up and down and like this whole thing had no idea. That's Never really, done. I think that's a beautiful story for a bunch of reasons. Mm-hmm. Uh, first of all, just on the merits, uh, no notes. Very funny thing to not know how to operate. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but I like the the bro care element where you mm-hmm. like called somebody you trusted and you're like, I forgot how to tie my shoes, dude. And he's like, yes. all right, I'll be right over like to show you how to like put the choo-choo through the tunnel and pull it tight. <laughs> These stories can't happen you. anymore though because everyone's documenting everything. So this mm-hmm. is like right before like the Instagram's just for pictures and yeah. Snapchat's not a thing. So there's no video of my friend just recording me in my in my yeah. dorm room being like, look at this dork not knowing how to do Last do-do-do-do. moments of anonymity. I, yes. I also feel like you picked a tough one because that's like one of those things where as much as there is on YouTube, mm-hmm. I think there's probably not a how to use blinds instructional video on there. That that's like one that they just <laughs> they haven't gotten to making that one yet. Yeah. Like no one thought of it. Yeah. Well, but, there you go. They, and there's no way of knowing if they're good or not. Like there's the a video to which I return often is. Mm-hmm. Uh, have you seen the video of that woman making an old fashioned? That involves like <laughs> emptying like half a bottle yes. of Jim Beam into a pint glass yes. with onions <laughs> some ice cubes. <laughs> like just because it's an instructional yeah. video does not mean you should follow those instructions. Like mm-hmm. sometimes, but there's some... so many people that do though. You know, know that so many people watch that and we're like, I guess that's what we're supposed to do. That's that's how it works. I think it would be hilarious to make that drink. Make yourself just a twelve ounce <laughs> old fashioned. that has got a bunch of like two orange wedges. Uh, yeah. 16 ounces of straight bourbon whiskey. Oh, my God. I I don't even know. Like, I guess the other thing, too, is just, like, cleaning your laptop where you're like, I didn't know you could clean it. I just thought it, it once it got dirty enough and nasty enough, throw it away. You yeah, get another working. One. Yeah. Yeah. There was a lot. I mean, college was great for that, too, because mm-hmm. you were confronting, like, the limits of, like, how babied you were. And there was always yeah. somebody that, like had it weirder like i had a guy on my floor that had never cut his own toenails he was from a foreign country his grandma had done it that okay. was just how his family did it and like no one walked him through it but they were like it's just like cutting your fingernails but a little bit harder and uh-huh. you gotta you gotta lean over and use you know they're on your feet of course mm. but then there was still stuff for me that like like i had done laundry yeah but i had only done laundry like in the machines in my parents' basement. And so right. you go to like these like coin op things and they're all big. And I was like, where I have to like, I was really into cleaning the lint trap. <laughs> that was a real like. You're just like terrified of burning down the, the yes, building. Exactly. Mm. Like I was like, this is not going to be my fault because I'm like mm. washing my like circle logo, the game hats <laughs> over and over again, you know? And in this case, like, yeah, it was all these like industrial machines. Like I was, it's like the, cavemen in 2001 mm-hmm. just like banging a stick on the side yeah. of it trying to get it to do what i needed it to do incredible well now look at us high We're functioning adults married uh, married doing our podcast thing. mics I mean, podcast is, mics it could happen to you anybody that's listening or watching eventually I'm sh- you like i get comments to... sometimes still like they're like what is that hair all over your mic i have a floof dog like i have a Keyshawn mm-hmm. that just sheds all- she's asleep right behind me right now mm-hmm. I will clean this, and this will be full of her hair by yeah. the next day. It's just, hey, when you have a floof dog, it's over. Like, I've, I've given up. Like, yeah, the floof I mean, it's is good, everywhere. Good content, I'm assuming. Like, you got a, a yeah. cute animal to photograph and stuff. Like I do. That. Like, the wedding photos of her, we got her coming in at the end, like, running down to see us. There's some... She's a very uh, very uh, front-facing member of our family. She's all about good. it. Being able yeah. to... Uh, that's, like... And also respect you for getting it together enough to have, like, a dog when you got married. Yes. I know a lot of people that, like, that wasn't, they weren't at that stage in their life until, like, you get married first, then you're like, okay, I can do a couple mm-hmm. of basic things. Maybe now I can have a more involved pet. Yeah. Like, I've had a turtle for 20 odd years, but that's a very low impact pet. What is have. his name or her name? Uh, Marvin is okay. the surviving one. There was uh, another turtle passed over the winter, um, mm. which was sad, but it's like, I Were they siblings? 
I don't know. So I bought them out of like a drywall bucket on Canal Street in Chinatown. And you, uh-huh. they were just selling. You could get two of them and a little plastic container and some food for $20. This was probably like 2002. Uh-huh. And I, uh, it was a total impulse buy, like just me. I'd like met friends for lunch down there. And I was like, oh, these guys look cute. And I brought them home. And then like later in the game, yeah. I learned that turtles live for like 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> so I have... I am pot committed to these dudes. The one, George, who died in December was like at least 20, <laughs> you know? Like, he had a good long life. Yeah. And, yeah, like, as far as I 40 know... 40 years? Yeah. So I took uh, Marvin to the, the vet recently, and the doctor mm-hmm. was like, you know, he's not going to live another 20 years. He's going to live at least another 10. So that's like a 30-year lifespan. He's, and yeah. he's healthy. That's just how it is. There's a, a pond in Central Park in Manhattan yeah. that is full of just this type of turtle. And I'm sure, because they're not like native to here, mm-hmm. but I think it is like the result of people that got them on an, a whim. And then either they were like m- moving into a no turtles co-op or just were like, <laughs> I did not sign up for 25 yeah. more years. Like everyone does the Googling after getting the turtle. Yes. Where it's, yeah. And then they're like, oh, so this will outlive me. That's cool. Yeah. I'll just <laughs> put that in my will so that. Who gets the turtle? Yeah um that's amazing what kind of turtle is it it's a red-eared slider which is like red a real common uh okay. one of their the real charming traits that they have is that they're covered in salmonella so every time i touch them i have to wash my hands oh my god even yeah. if it's like in your house like they still just carry it even if it like isn't going yeah, anywhere it's else like naturally occurring they're just well i mean i don't know if it is exactly salmonella it's basically like it will have the same effect on you like you have to be very careful with it Wow. But yeah, they're they're dumb creatures. Uh, mm. The reason I took him to the vet was that uh, he had gotten a tummy ache and had barfed up like 40 pebbles that he had eaten when I had pebbles in the tank like 15 years ago. I haven't had them <laughs> in there in a long time. And the vet was like, yeah, they do that. They'll eat anything that's around. They're fine. That's wild. Yeah, they're completely unreasonable creatures. But uh, a lot easier to handle than a floof dog. I never have to clean anything up except for the tank every month or so. There you go. Yeah. Um, it, it's funny. My The first thing I caught actually as a kid growing up in Atlanta was a snapping turtle. Those are um, scary, though. Those are scary. They'll mess you up. Snapping turtles and, like, they obviously broke the line. Um, but, like, you're pulling it out and it's just the the mouth of a snapping yeah. turtle up close is wild. And it yep. wasn't just in a random... Uh, pond in Tequila, which means nothing to you, David, but just but, uh, more in the country of Atlanta. And it was it was wild. Like, snapping turtles are huge and terrifying. But yes. also, yeah, I don't know. And they will show up. Play. I remember there was there was a rumor of one being in the, like, sort of town, like, pool, swimming holy type thing that we had where I grew up. Uh-huh. And it was, you know, it was, like, managed by the town. It probably wasn't there. But there was, like, an island in it and everybody was like do not go there there's a snapping turtle there like it'll mm. like, i heard it killed a kid you know just but they're, they're idiots. <laughs> probably not you know, yeah. like yeah if, even before you could like look things up online it was like very mm. clear to see like a picture of it you're like this is not a situation that you want to mess around with at all yeah um well uh we do have some other stuff to us i was gonna say about. this has just been pet chat you want to talk about some of the stuff that you talk about on the podcast no, I mean, Pet Chat's good. We're very pro-pet on this yep. podcast. Um, what are you reading right now, David? What have, uh, what have you found yourself really I reading? I am reading, so I just finished reading a couple of books, sports books, for this mm-hmm. reading series that I do with, with Patrick Sauer. So they were good. I read Ben Mathis Lilly's book about um, Michigan football uh, and uh, called The Hot Seat, and then uh, Jason Reed's book called The Rise of the Black Quarterback. We, mm-hmm. had, we did, like, an event with them. So now I'm back to, like, reading the actual, you know, books that i read that aren't about sports i had started mm. one uh called entangled life hmm. it's about mushrooms and okay. uh like just sort of like the way that they work it's incredible it's very dense it might be the sort of thing where i have to like put it down to read whatever the next sports book is at mm. some point but it is brilliantly written and they're the most amazing creatures on earth like i can't believe that mushrooms and like in general that like fungi are are real you and my wife Uh, would be best friends david she like whenever we're walking around she stops immediately when she sees a fairy circle or anything mushroom related very into mushrooms is she on the is she like at that level where she's comfortable picking them and cooking them or is it so my wife um 
God bless her for a billion reasons, but she's like very trusting with just nature and whatever mm-hmm. she sees out there. So like if there are we risks pull... to this. Yeah, no risks. Where she will eat any berry off any tree, like no matter where we're at. Like, oh raspberry. <laughs> and I'm like, ah, yeah. eh, can't do it. Let's we'll see uh, what happens. Yeah. yeah. She's a free spirit. And one of the reasons I love her is I am not that way whatsoever. Where I'm just like, that'll kill you. That yeah. that right there is uh, pesticides and everything else. Where I'm like, nope, don't trust it. Don't yeah. don't trust it. But she's like, yeah. If I, I mean, I'm certain if the mushrooms that we see were not in people's yards, by and large, yeah. she would rip them out and be like, yeah, it's fine. It's just a mushroom. So I have a couple of coworkers that are like, they're capable. They've like done whatever the ten thousand mm. hours of like identifying. They know stuff, and so they're confident doing it. Like getting Nathan and Patrick Redford from Defector will both mm. like. Go What's up, YouTubers? Mushrooms. I missed that. Yeah, they, yes, he brings that energy to finding mm-hmm. like morels, you know, mm-hmm. in the woods, and that's cool. Like, I love eating mushrooms. I like cooking with them. Like, and I like the idea of getting them for free. That sounds tight. Yeah, but there's just I, there's so much I don't know that I have never. It'd be I, such I a dumb way to die. Them. It is the super, it, and you're in pain the whole time, and so the mm-hmm. whole time you're doing it, you're like, this is all my fault. It's have all you heard the I next words? I want to go pay about... for a mushroom at the supermarket. It's one of those Nick Swartzen from like 17, 18 years ago had a bit where he was like uh, dying from poisoning yourself is just the most embarrassing way to go out because he's like, did you ever happen to Nick? What? He was poisoned? Oh my God. By who? (laughs) Nick. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. You never want to go out playing a prank on Mm -hmm. yourself. That should not be a cause of death. That's rough, man. Yep. Um, there you go. Do you read, are you, do you find yourself? Cause like I balance like my daily reading, I, I try and go back and forth and I try, like, I think I found for me, like talking about sports for a living and reading and writing about sports that like reading nonfiction sports books are hard. Yeah. Um, I, cause I think I identify more with novel. Like I just uh, finished up how lucky, uh, Will's book. Oh yeah. Uh, it's supposed to be so great. good. Yeah, we had so him on the good. podcast to talk about it. Drew read it and loved mm. it. I have not read it, but it's very good and it's an mm. easy read. Like Will's writing is very easy to read. Like he's he's got one of those things that I feel like if you're not a writer, you might miss. But he has the short sentence mastery yep. that is so difficult to come by because I am an M dash lover. I am a. Same. It's so Obviously, hard yeah. to shorten and like to really uh, craft your sentences in a way that just hit one like. It, it's a it's a special talent that he has that i, really I would i wish it. i had i envy it because i don't have it but it right. is also like it's that you know there's something to this i think that like depending on who you read when you're mm. like figuring out how you want to write you know you sort of for me anyway that like yeah, i just assimilated all of the different things that i liked from the writers that were important to me when i was mm-hmm. young and then i've just been mushing them together in different formations and adding new writers on top of it ever since but what that winds up with because I'm also an M dash boy is Mm. like this kind of like impacted, you know, you can wind up with like very long, very show offy sentences where like, and I do my best to, to keep that in check, Mm. but the writers where you like, don't really even notice them writing where it's just the sort of thing where it like everything sort of goes down the way it's supposed to. There's no, you know, like sort of like extra pyrotechnics that like that, I don't know. It speaks to like a, a pretty enlightened, I think, way of, of thinking about it too, because mm-hmm. you're just like, you're just telling the story. You're not making yourself a part of it, which I have, you know, when I read the blogs that I'm really having a hard time writing, you know, I, I can still kind of force it out, get it on mm-hmm. the website because that's like part of the job. But they feel overworked in a way that like when I'm right and when I'm feeling good about what I'm writing, like it's never easy, easy for me. Like I, like just have a hard time focusing on stuff to a certain extent but you can see when i'm forcing it and i Hmm. think like you can definitely tell uh, with will i think it's always been the case i mean with his writing like whether it's movies or or sports or whatever that like when he's right it's just like you know one long finished thought Mm presented ably like it's a great thing to be able to do yeah I find but it's I, I, to hard, your point about man. nonfiction sports books too. Like I, yeah. I wouldn't be reading them. I don't think as much if it wasn't for the, uh, for the obligation to do the, yeah. the bit with with Patrick. And it's good in some ways. It's like I've read some really interesting books that way, um, and you know, and I get them you know mailed to my home, so that's yeah. nice. But 
Yeah, like I feel like I get a lot of sports in the monitors every day as it is. And right. Like, so the idea of even when I'm interested in stuff like this, I read Howard Bryant's book about Ricky Henderson. And it's great. Mm-hmm. And I was fascinated by Ricky Henderson as a kid. Like, and he's played for so long that, you know, like I cheered for him, you know, as an adult too, like mm-hmm. when he was with the Mets and I was in my 20s. And even there is a terrific book and it's got a lot of really interest. Like it's sort of the first third of it is basically like a history of the great migration mm-hmm. as told through like Oakland high school sports of the like 50s, 60s and 70s. Mm-hmm. It's terrific. It's like really interesting stuff. And yet if left to my own devices, I would just read a novel like Same. all the time because that's like the sort of vacation I'm trying to get from reading is like you get that more from, from fiction than from anything else. Yeah, I think that's because I'm right there with you because if I'm, I'm my bookshelf is all right here. And I mean, I'm looking at it right now. I would say it's probably 70 percent novels and then probably like 20 percent political nonfiction yeah. and then 10 percent uh, sports nonfiction. I just it's just not and it. I, I wonder if it's for other people like people who are accountants or whatever for their day jobs they're like oh an awesome sports thing that i can spend a lot of time jumping into because i don't have the time to jump into this yeah um it's like some cocktail chatter for me that i can just talk about this new sports book that i read and like oh this is cool do you know about this about this person and blah, blah blah and it's like that's not me whatsoever like books are my escape because i spend so much of my day like i have to read like you said on the monitors like we have to spend so much time on pff and yeah. football outsiders and espn plus and everything else that you're like that's just so much of my day that's yeah. not what i want to do when i'm on the couch i'm always really like wary of complaining too much about that because it's like, yeah once it became clear that i wasn't going to be a professional athlete when mm. i was like 12 or 10 or younger Mm -hmm. it was like if the second best thing was like yeah you're just gonna like think about baseball all the time and write Mm -hmm. about it whenever you feel like it that sounds great like that is really good that's better Mm -hmm. than like i'm happier doing that than i would be like having a real job that contributed something to society you know Mm -hmm. for instance and yet like there is this element of it where it's like even if it's something that you care about even if you'd be on pff that many hours every day at your regular job just because like you want to know more about you're out Justin you're quite Herbert. quitting you want to know everything about justin mm-hmm. herbert or whatever it, there's still the the challenge of like then have like feeling like you're obligated to do it mm-hmm. really just like it changes the the whole valence of it the vibe of it if you wrote a book do you think you would do a novel would you follow the the drew and will path <laughs> I mean, I wrote a novel when I was in my 20s and it didn't work. Uh, Why didn't it work? Because I wasn't a good writer yet. Mm. I mean, also, it like, I wrote it. I mean, I finished it. Um, yeah. I had an agent who tried to sell it. And it, maybe it would be different now because I have, like, Twitter followers. You know, at the time, mm-hmm. it's like there wasn't even any of that. So there was no way to – I was just another, you know, butthead trying to write a novel about being sad. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's a – you know, those are abundant and of low value. I would – I would love to write a novel, I think, if I had to, you know, write a book, period. I think it would be easier to do, like, a collection of essays or whatever. But I've never mm-hmm. really gotten it together to even try to do that. I mean, I think some of it is that, like, the the process of writing, like, helps me figure the world out from one moment mm-hmm. to the next. And so I really am, like, in that way, habitually, like a blogger like yeah. it's just like as i take things as they come in that way and i process them and some of the more involved stuff i do it's like you know you read like if you're gonna write stuff about like brett Favre and this whole thing in mississippi like you're gonna read like two years worth of reporting from mississippi today it's not yeah. the sort of thing where you like read a blog react read and react and yet like even that is like it's a discrete process you know like mm. you sort of know when you're done and maybe I'm like putting books on a pedestal or or maybe I'm letting myself off the hook on like doing some actual harder work. But that feels like so much more open-ended a process that I've always found it really intimidating just to think about. Hmm. The thing that you can say for Will and Drew that they have in common, they're very different writers in their yeah. way, is that both of those guys also just sit down and bang stuff out. Mm-hmm. Like Drew's a machine. Like he <laughs> writes thousands of words a week. Mm. And like, and he's very... You know, for a guy that writes all the time about, like, goofy stuff, like, he is very orderly in his approach. You know, mm-hmm. like, he, like, gets up at a certain time, does this. You know, he's got kids and stuff, so some of it is, like, sort of thrust upon him. But he breaks his day down into that. Whereas, like, I spend half the day just, like, 
sitting in some weird position on the couch, like <laughs> thinking about something. Like maybe I write something that day, maybe I don't. But it's like, mm-hmm. and that's, you know, I would need to whip myself into shape to a certain extent to, I think, even be able to think about doing a book just because. Well, maybe Drew could just drop off one of his kids uh, <laughs> at Uncle David's house for six four months. Get my four hours yeah. earlier. Yeah, mm-hmm. because they're like, somebody needs to make me a sandwich for school. And I'd be like, that sounds <laughs> terrible, man. It sounds terrible for you. <laughs> oh, my God. I am not prepared for any of that in my life. But it, it is true. Like, it's... You just got married, man. Give it, don't worry about it yet. You got plenty of time to enjoy this stuff. I enjoyed that part of the uh, being married so much that we just kept doing it. Yeah. And I mean, uh, didn't have kids. So, like, look at us. It's now. amazing, though, how uh, it, I didn't realize this until I got married. But, I mean, even with the engagement party and stuff like that. So, I got to be careful with how I frame this. But the uh, unsolicited advice um, that comes your way uh, very quickly is yeah. insane. Like, yep. and just the, no, you're going to have three. Or you you should have two. Or you, you, you're going to do this. And you're going to love this. And you're not going to like this. And it's. Like, are you, like, playing Weird. fantasy football with my life right now? Yes. Like, come on, man. <laughs> I hate yeah. that stuff so much. You seem like a two-kid family. Like, that. what are right. you talking about? Like, you're pro why because of my skull shape? Like, yeah. are you profiling me right now? Like, yeah. It's, it's weird. so weird. And, but everybody, especially, too, like, once you, like, sort of, like, start those, like, outward markers of, like, who you are. I mean, it's obviously if you're like wearing a kid around, then everybody's going to mm-hmm. be like, can I feed him? Can I, can I name him? You know, like, just yeah. like get in the way, but just like having a wedding ring on, like, especially you're still like in this earth. Cause you, it's been a matter of what? Weeks? It has been uh 12 days. Jeez. Yeah. So you're still in the <laughs> stage where it's like every now and then you're like, what the, what is this? Like yeah. on my hand. I remember the, this was like, if you read it in a short story, you would think it was too on the nose, but it kept happening to me. Mm. Made me change how I would be. I would take, you know, take the subway to work. Mm. And the way I used to do it was I'd hold a book, my right hand, and hold the sort of the bar when you're standing up so you don't fall down in the other. And, mm. you know, left hand has the wedding ring on it. And yeah. so for like a week, I would do that and reach up, you know, just the way with no thinking, the way I'd done it for 10 years living in New York before that, and just get the loudest metal on metal, like, Hang from like just <laughs> driving my ring into the thing yeah and it was like every time i was startled and finally i so i've changed it up now now i'm a right hand uh, pole holder and mm. <laughs> left hand book guy but it was like once you get to the point in this process where you're it doesn't feel weird that it's on your hand like you are mm. on the glide path there you go at this point i after 12 days after being married i was mostly just proud of myself that i'd gotten through the wedding okay same and that's it's a lot like, man. and that's real though i think that's reasonable I mean, you could experience this or it can identify with this too. It's just that like, I've never been that tired yep. um, at my wedding night. Like I've never been that tired and You're it's a different kind of tired. Where you... The whole time too, you're trying to like, but you have to talk to everybody. You're so, and you do so many emotional conversations yeah. and it's so draining yeah. <laughs> because you're just really given a lot uh, yep. all day long and you are, it's a different kind of tired that I could not begin to describe to people where like that sunday morning we woke up and we're like okay that's over like yeah. I, it's just it's a whole thing we had a great time at ours but i remember yeah my friend joel i remember after he got married a little bit older than me got married earlier and i remember before mine i was like so what what was it like like how did you feel when it was over mm. i was already looking forward to that part like the party was great but i was just looking forward to like getting back to normal same. And he said that it was like, it felt like he had survived a gunfight. Yeah. And I was like, that's a bit much, you know, like, and yet, like, I do remember that, that feeling of exhaustion because there's mm. something so dreamlike about being at your own wedding. And it's like, not everybody that you care about is there, but mm. a very much higher percentage of the people in your life that you care about are in one room mm-hmm. with you. Like, much higher than will ever be in that room with you again, yeah. probably for the rest of your life. There's something really dreamlike and weird about that. About, like, you can just look around and recognize every face mm. and everybody means something to you, you know? And they'll never all be in one place like right. this and ever like, again. You know, you'll continue to see them. You'll continue mm. to care about them. But, like, there will never be an opportunity for, like, the parents of my elementary school friends mm-hmm. to meet, uh, like, my uncle yeah like people that i went to college with you know like but you know, that's I'm, i hope they all like enjoyed the buffet the one time that they all got to party together yeah it's like where i landed on it 
I mean, we had the, I think we had a lot of crossover there in our experiences and you know, it's uh, it's nice. Like you, I was just, it, you, when you're done with it, but like that week of man, that it's tense because yeah. you're just hoping everything goes. On. I remember I was just telling people, I'm like, I, this is why I broke my foot, David is because I it was a pre-wedding thing. It was a pre-wedding thing. Oh, so no. I did the whole wedding with no, uh, nothing on my foot or oh, I had boy. to power through that day where it's your flu game. It was my flu game. Um, Michael, speaking of flu game, Michael Jordan broke the exact same thing I did in 1985. Wow. Uh, navicular stress fracture and his third metatarsal. Did you break it doing the same stuff? Uh, uh, basically the same. On Michael Jordan and I. Yeah. Um, no, I have been a runner for 16 years. And that apparently takes a toll when you enter yeah. your 30s. And I've never broken a bone, ever. But I was running a lot that week uh like i was upping my time yeah um because i was stressed man like with grad school with the wedding with everything else i was just like that's my happy place that's what i do uh to clear my head and to kind of you know uh get through the day and i was on mile three and i was uh i don't know if you knew this or not but knoxville tennessee rocky Uh, yeah it's a little rocky one of the very hilly yeah and it's very hard on your your body. Uh, very different than when I was running the streets of Atlanta. I'll say that. And I just took a hard step off the uh, off the sidewalk on one of my streets, and I just put so much stress on the top of my foot. And I heard it pop, like I had noise canceling headphones on, and I still heard it, which terrified me to no end. Because oh, if boy. they heard, if I heard it through that, then my pop must have like been somebody walking by on the street heard it. Then, like, yeah, it would have been like that's disgusting. Um, <sighs> what just happened there? and i just it it was rough so i stayed off it wednesday and thursday and then friday was still mostly off it icing and all that kind of stuff and i got an x-ray and they're like that's when they found out like there was that and i was they were like you can't really do more damage to it over the wedding like it's just it's kind of already broken and it's like the whole thing too it's like the uh now canceled uh certain comedian who had this bit where it's very true when you get to a certain age and you're not an athlete and you're they're just like oh it's just shitty now when you yep. just tear something or you mess it's like ozzy albies like tore his foot like the broke his foot the same way and he uh had immediate surgery and he's back and he's rehabbing hard and then yeah. he's just back to normal they don't do that with normal citizens uh when you break you break your foot it's a very different experience right. where they're like you're gonna be in a boot and we'll see what happens but there's but no it's... circumstances under which they're gonna be like mr roth we recommend tommy john surgery yeah. <laughs> like we, we're gonna get you to kneel ella trash right away like yeah. no they'd they just be like you're not gonna ever throw good again which yes. is fine that's a hundred percent what they were, were telling you me. throwing well before <laughs> yeah you know it's just like yeah that element of it I'd you're just so... gonna be in pain and you're yeah. gonna just see how much you can withstand but uh your foot might not be the Did same and i to... A yeah. point in the wedding where you were able to enjoy yourself. I hope that you. Oh did. yeah. All right, good. But I will say, the end I was of the stressed night. as hell beforehand. But it was that there's some point where you realize that nothing you do is going to change what's going to happen. That it's just in in God's hands. It's in yeah. a matter of gravity, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> At that yeah. point, you're just sort of like, all right, well now it's a party, and I can like have a beer and do what I need to do. Well, that's the other part. You just take your mind off it. That's the big part of it is like, I was not thinking about my foot. So there's part of the endorphins and, uh, that you're just, you're not aware of what's going on really. And then at the end of the night though, so that's when you crash and realize, Oh my God. Like the pain was immeasurable at the end of the night. But I will say this was something that scared me because I got really mad at the photographers, uh, where I was, they think I, they probably still think I was joking, but I was so mad because they asked me to dip my wife as we're going through the sparklers and the end for the photos. I get all that. The problem with dipping is you have to put all of your weight on my broken foot. Like not my weight, but also my wife's weight to just do that. Like that's excess that I could not do. Like that was one thing I told her. Like I cannot do that. I'm sorry, but like there's no way I'm going to be able to handle that. What would, and, did they have a counter argument? They were like, no, we always take these photos. Well, no, it was just in the moment. So everyone's like, yeah, Dipper. So everyone at my wedding is just like in on it. So I have no <laughs> choice to try, but to try because everyone's staring at me to do this thing. So I knew, like, I was mad because I was like, I'm in a, like, I, I'm backed into a corner here. I've got to yeah. at least attempt it in the moment. I, when I tell you, like, I've never screamed internally more than when I got halfway down and I was like, nope. And I, like, hopped around and I was like, we're going back to the cabin. We're done. Like, this is the end of the wedding. I, yeah. I can't do it anymore. I almost just fractured my foot worse and I'm going to lose my foot if we stay at this wedding any longer. So we need to go. 
you got it. That's a matter of priorities. Like yeah. it's important to be married. It's important to get good photos. Uh, you're going to yes. need that foot for like pretty much the rest of your life. Yes. So I'm in the boot until Halloween and we're going to see what happens. But I mean, like I said, like they, if they were like, Oh, we need surgery. I'm like, yeah, great. Not doing it. I'm not yeah. putting bolts in my foot and just doing this for six months. I'm just not going to have a great foot on uh, my left foot anymore. Yeah, like that's... I bet it'll get, from what I remember with stress fractures, I had them when I was in cross country or I had, well, like shin splints or whatever, yeah. basically that. And that it is it's like the junior varsity version of that. And mm-hmm. like, you know, some rest will do you a lot of good. And I know, yeah. you're, I mean, if you've been running for that long, then you don't need me to tell you that uh, there's probably a sneaker related solution that someone is going to recommend. I have no idea if I'm terrified to run though. Apparently like when you do this, like you're 20 to 30% more likely to break the same foot in the same year. Yeah. So like, I don't know if I'm going to like getting through that roadblock. I'm just going to be a swimmer. I'm telling you, David, we're just, I'm transitioning to swimming. I'm the old guy at the pool now just doing my laps. Uh, My friends that were running freaks like that all mm. wound up having to become swimmers too. For them, it's usually the back, but it's the same deal. Like it's just, it's hard in your body. The body's built to do that much. My sister and her husband are both training for the marathon again, and they're doing great, but it's mm. like there's so much less margin for error at this point, and so mm. they both had, like, injuries that knocked them out of training for, like, you know, you could lose a week, and it's like that. Yeah. The way that marathon training is, it's like you kind of can't get that back if it happens close enough to the thing, but I'll be there to see, and we live, like, a half block from the course, so the New York City Marathon is always a big deal for us. We when like, is it? It's... Uh, november i want to say the okay. first or second sunday in november i don't remember which one okay. but it's always cool it's like a big sort of positive vibe party thing you know it's like little kids high-fiving strangers and stuff so stuff that you like to see yeah and then it goes back to being new york instantly <laughs> Sorry. uh the mets though we yeah. end on this david right. what we're mortal them? enemies yeah this weekend because our two teams that are exactly as good as each other are going yes. to play each other Apparently I'm, not in the middle of a bunch of uh, Hurricane Ian weather, though, so that's nice. Very excited for that, because if that yeah. had been moved, like, that's a disaster for Major League Baseball, if they have to yeah. move that, because you know both fan bases and you, and just teams in general, no matter how the series went, would have been like, doesn't count, this is right. BS, and it shouldn't have gone this way. So I'm there glad we're going to... all the options. I remember seeing that yesterday with the proposals. It was like, they mm-hmm. didn't even mention a neutral site, I mean, yeah. because they knew everybody would freak out. Mm-hmm. But all the other ones were like, they'll just play a doubleheader the day before the wild card game. And it's like, no, that, like that's no. all so bad. There's no yeah. options. Like, I'm glad it's going to... It looks like the weather's going to be good. I have made my peace uh, with whatever outcome there is, because like the Mets are good. They brought me a lot of joy this year. Like It's mm-hmm. been a minute since I could have said that and meant it. And, like, I don't know how, you know, obviously, if you were to take the two competitive windows that the two teams have, like, I'd for sure rather be the Braves. I just think Hmm. they've got, like, it's different. You know, the Mets did about as much as you can do just by spending money. Uh, And they took a team that was actively bad last year, and they made it into a really good one this year. And a lot of that is just getting off-season transactions right like i would expect to like hail billy epler's genius again that many times in the future but like i i had some thoughts about the trade deadline not being exactly what i wanted but Mm -hmm. they improved the roster a lot they're good they're also older more expensive and they're on the clock in a way that the braves aren't but you know they're two really good teams like if you tell me last year at this time that the Mets would be exactly as good as the Braves and the Braves hadn't even won the world series yet. I'd be like, hell yeah, let's, let's do it. And now mm-hmm. they're like, you know, whatever. I think they are. I think the Braves and the Mets are both about as good as each other. I think nobody is as good as the Dodgers. And I think the Dodgers are maybe like 10% better than anyone else. But the fun part of October is it doesn't matter. Yeah. The Braves were not the best team in baseball last year. No, you know, and but they got hot at the right time. Yep. And that's always cool when that happens. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, it's annoying when it happens to you, Mm -hmm. but it is the sort of thing where yeah like that's a hundred percent a thing that can work not just because october is random and baseball stupid either it's like this is it like this is like that's the way that the game works like it's not just a function of it being a five game series or a seven game series or you know whatever bullpens being used differently like if you (laughs) like luck into having jorge soler abruptly turn into willie mays for like Mm -hmm. a month like great yeah you are I, we, How are you feeling about the Braves, I guess, is the question that I would ask. Can I tell you the worst thing about me being a fan was mm-hmm. last year? 
and I wonder if you experienced this a little bit. Baseball in uh, October, like already football season's going on. The NBA is back in less than a month as well. So this is like go time. Like all, everything's back and you have to be very careful with how you prioritize your, your sports watching and like what you watch and everything. Those games every single night, four hours of just intense, like I have to sit on the couch and I'm like shaking just seeing how it's going night overnight while also just having this avalanche of other sports content to watch was exhausting yeah, like a deep playoff run for your team is so exhausting that part of me is like am i up for this again am i up for another deep player ace playoff run because the games go longer they're way more intense way more uh, just emotionally like actually feel like bad when they lose in a way that like for the regular season this year like once it yeah. became clear that the mets were good i was like fine i'll have my fun right like i'm not gonna i don't need to see every inning i don't need to like forensically go over everything like mm-hmm. they're fine i'll come back you know, like we're gonna be fine up. in October. Like we're just gonna be there. Like we just check in and we do our thing, but they're fine. Yeah, but like that doesn't get you prepared emotionally no. for like the heavy lifting of that. It's, the last time the Mets made a deep playoff run was 2015. I covered that. I mm-hmm. was at just at home, but I was at all the City Field for all the games in the NLCS and the World Series, and mm-hmm. I was a fucking mess. <laughs> exactly, like, I just couldn't hack it, and it, I had never really been in like a press box for a game I cared about before. You know, I'd been like here and there of different games, different credentials. And like, you know, you show up, you take your notes, you go interview a guy and you, you're done. And mm-hmm. for this one, it was like, because I cared and because I had really, I think thought that the Mets would never make the world series again, as long as they were owned by the Wilpons mm-hmm. that like, I'd be there, you know, white knuckling it, trying not to be an ass in front of like Pedro Gomez or any of the few guys that were in the press box that I like recognized and respected Mm -hmm. and didn't want to have them be like, this is why I will never be crying when Daniel Murphy made an error or whatever, you know, like, but I would go out every game. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, had my computer, did the, you know, got set up, do the things you got to do. And then at, for one inning, I would go out, I'd buy one beer and I would just power walk around the stadium (laughs) and drink that beer and yell and like, Mm -hmm. Like a stranger wanted to high five me because like Juan Uribe did something good. I would high five that stranger, mm. but that was my time to like try to be a normal person. And then I would have to go back up, you know, or be myself, I guess. Mm. And then I would have to go back up and, and try to be a professional again. Uh, I'm ho- looking forward to, you know, obviously I will write about whatever happens there, mm. but I am very much looking forward to like watching those games at home, being able to go to bed, like when I want to, not when like, Mike Moustakis is done talking, you know, and like, mm. and then when the seven train delivers me, uh, yeah. so I, I'm looking forward to it for now. It's easy for me to say that, like, we'll see how I feel. Like if we wanted to check back in in three weeks, we both just absolutely look like shit with like big yeah. Pete Davidson rings under our eyes. Cause we can't sleep because of how mm-hmm. anxious we are. Then, you know, that would be a funny punchline to this. Uh, I hope that doesn't happen, but I don't know. I know. And we'll see what happens. I think this weekend will be fun. It's like, predictions of like i don't know man baseball's weird and this weekend like we've never seen this before like we've never been in a situation in our adult lives of the braves the mets being exactly the same and being just as good going into the last weekend where everything is on the table like this is just uncharted waters that i have no idea how this is gonna go it's just gonna be fun yeah and it like it means a lot but it's not the sort of thing where like you're gonna wind up having to go home like you're gonna wind up having to go i mean play it sucks Dodgers. if you get this That's wild card spot want. like you don't get the buy because whoever yeah. wins this you're gonna be one of the top two seeds so mm-hmm. you're getting a first round buy which is huge but also if you get this if you're the wild card team you're getting the padres probably yeah. and the padres have a better road record than home record this year so this is terrifying like i have yeah. no biz i do not want any part of the padres Getting like, yeah, definitely that's the part of it where like Mm-mm. my attempt at being like all Buddha nature and cool about this <laughs> mm-hmm. like completely falls by the boards or is just like the idea of being like, congratulations, you made the playoffs. Like now you have to go deal with like, yeah, deal with the Padres, deal with the Dodgers, like deal, like no thanks. Like yeah. the, at this point, like the moment the, uh, the gratitude vanishes as, and I become entitled as soon as I get the opportunity. That's just how fan brain works, I guess. There you go. I mean, big boy's got an owl, pet owl, so it's yep. everything's coming up Atlanta right now. Uh, yeah. I feel good about that. They're a good team, man. If they weren't the damn Braves, I'd probably like them a lot more. But... <laughs> there you go. I also got this. Um, this doesn't look this heavy. Mm-hmm. So this is Grimwald. Um, oh, yeah. Like, got him in Asheville during our honeymoon, right? Just super cool. Big into, I'm a big gargoyle guy. Mm-hmm. Got gargoyle guy. Um, and all into it. 
this is made in Atlanta. And I was like, done deal. Like made in Atlanta. I need to know where this came from, but uh, just the cool stuff like that. So um, so very big into uh, owls in this. uh, There's a gargoyle factory in Atlanta? Apparently. Like, because this guy was made. I would like to know more about this. He's like 25 pounds. This dude is heavy. And he's reading. So his name's Grimald. And uh, yeah, big fan. Yeah. Congrats on the gargoyle and getting married. Uh, thank you. You know, in that order. Yes. Uh, but yeah, thank you for, for having me on, dude. I appreciate it. This was a blast. I'm glad yeah. we were able to reconnect, my friend. Good stuff. Um, yeah, it's been a minute, but I'm very happy to be able to do it again. So let's, sometime in the next five or six years, I guess we should pick this back up. Yeah, I think so. We should do it more often. More yeah, often, sure. David. All right. Um, well, don't forget, folks, go subscribe to Defector.com, a very good website if you have not already done so. I'm subscribed, been subscribed for how many years now has it been we just two we just had two. our second okay. birthday uh in early september there you go um it's well worth uh the monthly subscription cost and listen to the distraction with drew and david each week on apple spotify rubber gear podcast david thank you so much and i thank will talk you, to you dude. again very soon like your dog is up all right take care dude. you heard that right yeah, yeah I did. Khaleesi is, <laughs> she's done with the podcast bye right. david see you man